Ah, uh, hello. Ooh. Yep, there we go. Look at that. We got it. Uh, hello, everyone. Oh, always crooked. Always crooked on this thing. It is just attached to a chair after all. Thank you, everyone, for joining in. Mr. Akers, Dr. Akers, good to see you. Uh, Scott, good to see you. Dr. Akers, good to see you. Ad Moen, thanks for joining in. Uh, as you already know, I'm on here every single night, live at 8 o'clock. Um, 8 p.m. every single night, I'm doing a live stream from my whiskey office here. Uh, bits of whiskey in front of me, bits of whiskey behind me. Whiskey in front of me and behind me. It surrounds me in this bloody office, uh, which is good fun. Um, lots of green bottles, of course, as you'll imagine, but also lots of other little things kicking around, as always. Um, thank you, everyone who's just joining in now. Uh, Matt Music, Johnny Edwards, Petrino, thanks for joining the stream. Um, a few things to discuss tonight. A few things to discuss tonight. Um, something to discuss every night. That's why I'm here. So I want to talk about cask types, uh, specifically relating to wine. And uh, now we're going to nerd out a bit on this stuff, I realise. SMN, thanks for joining. We're going to nerd out on this stuff just for a moment because I, I've just had a lot of discussion about this in the last few days. Um, there's been a lot of discussion around... Um, wine casks, use of wine casks, X wine casks, um, why and when and how they're used in whiskey, which I find fascinating because uh, it's not a new thing, but it certainly had a bit of a resurgence uh, in the using, use, usage of wine casks, especially locally. But um, it also has, it has its implications across the world with different types of wine casks as well. And what that does to a spirit and whether it's favorable, whether it's non-favorable, when it should be used, when it should be ignored, and um, uh, all those kinds of things. Um, just before I, whilst a few of you are joining, uh, like uh, Monarch Perth, um, good to see you. Muzzman, of course, always a pleasure. Dram and bread. Dram and bread, that sounds tasty. We did a whiskey and bread night. For those who remember that we did a whiskey and bread night about 18 months ago, uh, maybe even two years ago now. Um, I'm not sure if that was last year or the year before. Uh... I don't know. I can't remember. Maybe one someone else from remind. I think it was last year. No, no, I'm pretty sure it was 2017. But we did a whiskey and bread night. That was well and above expectation. Uh, that was one of those nights where you think you know what's coming until the, there's a twist and turn throughout. It was 2017. Thank you, SMN. Thank you, Muzzman. Yes. I couldn't remember whether that was an early 18 or 27 event. But, um... The guys from um, Brasserie Bread, who um, who did that with us, have said, why don't we do it again? Let's do it again. So we're going to actually talk about that. We we'll, we'll, were in early discussions with them about doing another whiskey and bread night because it was hugely underrated. It was like like the pairings and the whiskeys and the food that night were were top notch. Uh, and I've got to be honest, like fresh, uh, fresh bread, fresh baked bread with a spread of salted butter. Simple, simple pleasures, simple pleasures. But it wasn't that. It was the fact that the actual breads and all the meats and everything that went with it. And the, the, the anyway, it was an amazing night. It was an amazing night. And we all learned something and we all had a good, good fun. Uh, time for another, this is Dr. Akers, I agree. Pogs88, thanks for joining. Uh, Tommy KMC, thanks for joining. So a few um, a few things to, to discuss. We'll we start talking about wine casks, the types of wine casks that are out there, um, when a wine cask to use, and when they shouldn't be used. Now, I'm gonna, you know what? One of my, <laughs> I've had like three or four people now tell me that one of their favorite live streams I ever did uh, on this on this stream was actually the one that I did from a train station because it was eight o'clock and I was at a train, I was at Central Train Station. And um, someone said, oh, I love the one you did at tra on the train. That was a real, that was a wild ride. Um, uh, and I thought, well, you know, that's fantastic. Um, so, and they liked it because I went on a bit of a rant. I did go on a bit of a rant. I had a few things to say that night because it was the first night after Whiskey Fair. It was the um, the train back from Whiskey Fair and it was a sort of a bit like, uh, there's, there's a lot to go over. Um, and I went on a bit of a rant. Tonight might be a little bit more, a little bit less ranty, but still I've got a few things I want to want to go on there. Ah, oh, location shoots. Dr. Akers, stay tuned. There's something coming with that. Um, the vast majority of Scotch whiskey is mature, matured in ex-bourbon casks. Now, that means that it could be probably ex-bourbon bar barrels or ex-bourbon hogsheads. A hogshead is slightly bigger than a barrel. But um, it doesn't mean that... And then the next, the second highest um, maturation type would be ex-sherry casks. Ex-Oloroso, ex-PX specifically. Ex-Pedro Jimenez, 
and ex Oloroso casks are the second most popular um, combined because uh, they're mostly seasoned casks. Not mostly, they're all seasoned casks these days. But they're um, that uh, that's um, that's symptomatic of where the trade is. Bourbon casks are cheap. They had only used once to make bourbon whiskey, um, so therefore they have to be reused. They are reused. They're used somewhere else, and that's where they're used in Scotch whiskey. We know all that already. We're going to just leave that as it is. There's a lot of different types of wine casks out there uh, now being used to mature whiskey. X wine casks that, if I'm being completely honest, might shouldn't probably be maturing whiskey. Wine casks, there's this perception sometimes, I think, on the consumer end of whiskey, on the, on the enjoyment end of, you know, sort of just like the entertainment and enjoyment of whiskey, that a wine cask is going to bring you a funky fun sort of like a level of um, intrigue and often you end up with well I should say not always but often you do end up with a lot of hot tannins a lot of um a lot of undesirable uh spice uh, and a lot of undesirable sort of extra wine maturation or full wine maturation that I think is sometimes a little bit sort of glorified and very rarely works and when it does work here's the problem when it does work it can be outstanding and we're talking wine here, not not fortified. Um, I'm talking about sherry. I'm not talking about Oloroso or PX. Even I'm not even talking about Fino or Amontillado casks. I'm talking about purely like X-ray wine casks. Um, I, I'll be honest. Two of the most disappointing whiskies I've had. Uh, I've got a, a list here of some whiskies I've tasted recently. Two of the most disappointing whiskies I've had recently, uh, and they weren't society casks. They would these definitely wouldn't have, wouldn't have passed our tasting panel. But one was a um, was an X. It was a whiskey from an X Palo Cortado cask uh and i sort of i expressed that when i tasted it with the group of people i was with and i said oh that's not really integrated this the spirit is sort of over here and the the cask is over here and never the twine shall meet and i was met with a bit of um a bit of sort of like oh um oh well you know you're wrong you know <laughs> your subjective yet trained palate is wrong and it's like uh okay yeah, fine whatever I mean, I, I take these things with a grain of salt because it's all very, it's all very, um, it, you know, it ta it's, it all takes its time, but, um, uh, mature and cooler bar casks. Gee, I hope not. Welcome back to 45 Finn. Uh, uh, Petrina says, I tried a 130, 130 not, is that 130, 139, 130.3, first fill barrique, ex Pinot Noir. Absolutely fantastic. Yes, Petrina, that's what I'm saying. When it works, if it works well, it can be outstanding. Uh, but it's just, I find for me personally, it's quite hit or miss. And I'm talking especially local spirits on that one. Um, Caltay 99 joined. Welcome, Caltay. A pleasure as always. Jamie Poos 1985. Welcome back, both of you. Um, so what So what we're talking about is wine casks, guys. I mean, it's just sort of how wine casks can imp impart a different flavor profile. And sometimes it's desirable and sometimes it's a bit like, ooh, I, I wish that, ooh, I was hoping for something else. And, and that's what I get sometimes. Um, Musket, Barolo, Chardonnay, Manzanilla, Amarone, Marsala, Moscatel, all sorts of different types of wine casks, fortified casks, sweet wines, etc. Sweet whites, sweet reds. They, um, they all take a difference. Now, what we're going to be dramming tonight, I'm going to be finishing off just this dram of, um, ah, that's a Brook Laddie. Yes, that's just a, um, Laddie Classic. I was having a bit of Laddie Classic to prepare for Saturday. I'm got writing a few more tasting notes, getting getting my grips back with the distillery. This Saturday is our rare brook laddie tasting. Now there's a couple of seats left, um, and I'm, I've got a little bit of a special offer which you can hear on this stream right now. Uh, but I'll tell you a bit that about that in a bit. Remind me, remind me. A bit of an offer for the laddie tickets. If you want to come along, that'd be great. It's this Saturday. Tickets are one ninety nine. It sounds high, but the, we're opening eighties. 80s uh, Brook Laddie and um, uh, Brent, we're going from the 1984 to 2019 across six whis seven whiskies. Uh, great. Shannon Blanc casks, yes. Um, hit or miss, I bet they never miss. The, no, I mean, they are hit or miss. No, not, I mean, not society casks, they go through a rigorous tasting panel to make sure that we the misses get filtered out. And currently, by the way, we, we reject, for those who are interested about tasting panel at the moment, the UK tasting panel, currently reject about 55 to 58% of what goes through panel. So 50, up to 58% of what they taste, over half of all the whiskies tasted in a session, there's like some bug flying around. Over half the whiskies tasted in each session are rejected. Uh, 
Now, a whiskey might be rejected because it's still too young, needs a bit longer in um, <laughs> meme culture. Come on, Calte. <laughs> meme culture. Uh, yeah, well, I mean, look, half of, them are, half of them are rejected because they might be too young. Half might be, the other, some are rejected because they're, um, they're never going to get any better and they're sort of, it's a dud cask. It's, an, it's a fourth fill, refill cask or something that's a bit tired. It's not, doesn't, you're leaving it longer isn't going to improve it. Another time it might, might be rejected because it's, it's overly, uh, overly sulfured, overly um, astringent, acidic, just like some of the flaws you'd find in a wine. Um. <laughs> oh, Johnny, you said that, not me. <laughs> but, um, I mean, you're right. Uh, <laughs> Uh, Sally L, is the Lady Night suitable for a whiskey beginner? You know what? That's a really good question. I'm going to off the bat say yes, only because we're going to explore. It's a distillery feature. We're going to explore different, like different expressions from one distillery. It doesn't matter whether it's 1980s whiskey or 2019s whiskey. It's about exploring whiskey and enjoying it how you like to enjoy it. I've never thought that there's any one single society event or really or any whiskey event these days where, you know, you've got to be a whiskey, you know, not uh, like... You got to be a whiskey sort of genius to to really enjoy it. I think that's a bit of a misconception, and often one where you you miss out on amazing experiences if you if you take that approach. Um, so what the way I like to do it is to say, well, um, okay, here's one for you. Quite early on in my whiskey journey, uh, after I'd tasted a few things here and there, but I was it I wasn't quite, I hadn't quite got it all yet, and I was sort of like learning so much. It was my real sponge year in whiskey. Uh, a good friend of mine uh, invited me to a um, Highland Park tasting uh, at the back of a bottle shop uh, and we tasted some vintage Highland Parks from the 1950s, 60s and stuff. You'd think, I'd think to myself, oh, I'm not, I'm not nearly advanced enough for that. It's like, no, 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 no. You just, I just, I just approached it, took my, took my time with it, tasted through things and went, oh, okay, that one's like, now I'm learning. And you only learn about these things from tasting them. Like, you don't, like, here's one. Here's the Redder Still, for instance. This one's on, on Saturday night. It's a 1984 full maturation uh, car strength um, Brook Laddie. And the uh, the other ladies are all on the table here somewhere. Look, I mean, it it's it's always, there's always more to learn. Like, you, I'm learning. I've been working at the Society now for four and a bit, four and a half years. Uh, I've been working in whiskey for nearly seven. Uh, I, I love every single day of it. And I learn something about whiskey or spirit, or distilleries, or whatever, every single day. If I wasn't still learning, I wouldn't be interested. That's how I, that's how I work anyway. It's just like, I love learning about this stuff because I get to, whatever I get to learn, I get to pass on to people. And one of the best things I ever hear is at the end of a tasting when someone compliments me for saying, and they say, oh, wow, you know so much about whiskey. And I, and I just think that's really nice to hear, but God, I've got so much more to learn. And I'm gonna probably think that for the rest of my life in that there's always something to learn. And always keep an, the other trick with, with with going to whiskey tastings is keep an open mind. You don't know what's going to happen. It could be around the court, around the around the corner. Something could be uh, it would just blow your mind, and you go, "Oh wow, I thought I always hated whiskey type X," and then you taste one of those whiskeys, and you go, "Wow, okay, maybe I was wrong. I actually really love those kind of whiskeys." Um, uh, <laughs> mind the glass with the fly swatting. Yeah, yeah. Thanks, Doctor Akers. Is lady night? Yes, um, always more to learn. It's, um, with tasting the uh, the ladies, what is your favourite year? Because ladies changed dramatically since the eighties. That's a good question. That's a good question, Cal. Um, you know what the the the, the ladies from the nineteen eighties, uh, they are magical pieces of history. But this is you know, there's three bottles here. I can pick all three up. Don't worry. There's three here, which are um from that era, including the the eighty six blacker still. The 84 red is still, and the 84 uh, red is still and gold is still, sorry. Um, you don't need to be, you don't need to be a, an expert to enjoy them. Um, but I think that they, they were three very lucky, uh, lucky releases, if I'm being honest. There was lots of, lots of rubbish spirit coming out of, of Scotland in the 80s. They know that. We know that. Like, we, we know that now, that there's a lot of casks sort of between 81 to 85, I'll admit. Some of them are great. Some of them are unbelievably good but some of them aren't that great it was a bit of a strange period in scotch whiskey history um uh so yeah it was a bit of a 
a funny period in Scotch whiskey. So those times change. Oh, wow. It's almost perfumed. I've left that in the glass. I poured that about 20 minutes before I started the stream. So that's at least 20, 30, 35 minutes almost in the glass. And it's gone from really sort of grassy and hay, hay needles to, to straight up aromatic perfumes. And I think I'm going to pour the whiskeys at Laddie tasting maybe a good 20 minutes before guests even arrive. I normally pour them as close as possible to guests arriving, but sometimes they do need a bit more air. That's always, that's always one. Here's, that's a quick discussion point. I'll get to that one in a moment. Um, uh, Dung PB 1975. Thanks for joining the stream. Um, so yeah, I mean, that, that's a good quick discussion for us to talk about. Aeration, aeration. Now, when you first open a bottle of whiskey, and the level's quite high, it's a fresh bottle, this one. It's only had a couple of drams missing. There's gonna be what I like to call the ethanol burn. The vapors that have been stored up in the neck of the bottle and you pour that, and if you pour that into a glass, I won't with this one, I've already got a dram. But you pour that into a glass, and you go, well, um, you know, you just sort of go, it's like, you first notice it, it's like, ooh, it's like, there's a bit of like, a, like, like the ethanol needs to sort of vapor off a bit in the glass. Let that sit, put that down. If you're impatient, have a cleansing ale in between. Uh, but just put that down for 20 minutes, 30 minutes, and come back to it. Um, 45 Finn, do you often leave the glass that long? Yes, I do. Uh, and by the way, 45 Finn, the, the older the whiskey, the longer I leave it. Um, I find that leaving, it, leaving an old whiskey in the glass can really, like it starts to almost syrup up, as, uh, as uh, our friend Tim Duckett would say. It syrups up. It sort of it becomes a, a bit more um, syrupy and vapory and, and, and not, uh, the word is sort of, it just, the vapors dissipate a bit more, but so not vapory, but the va vapors dissipate and it becomes a bit more sort of like um, oily and, uh, and even more viscous and lovely on the palate, which is always, which is always exciting, of course. Um, that's, that's what it's about. Uh, Lockie 87, always a pleasure to see you. Um, how long is settling time in a vat between decanting and bottling for SMWS? Johnny, that's an excellent question. I'm going to have to ask the whiskey team that one in the UK. I've never been asked that before. Um, I don't think there's much settling time in a vat, if at all. Um, as you know, we don't chill filter, um, so we don't need to settle or... Hold on. We don't chill filter, of course, but... And I'm, I'm not sure if we put into settling vats. I know that society whiskeys go through what's called a micron filter. It doesn't chill filter the whiskey at all. It just filters out... Uh, it stops you going from like this and, and in drinking... Um, drinking uh, chips of wood and... Um... Here's one for you, Johnny. I don't know if you remember this one. Um, 128.6. Uh, it was a six-year-old or seven-year-old. Um, it was a Pendarin. It was from a first fill chunks of charcoal. Yeah, sorry, that's what I meant to say, not wood chips. Chunks of, yeah, just the micron. We don't chill filter though. I don't know, I mean, I know one distillery in Australia that chill filters, but I don't know many. Um, yeah, anyway. Um, you probably know more than I do about that. Um, so, uh, we take, um... There was 128.6, I was saying. It was a Pendarin, and it was a six-year-old, or seven-year-old, from a first fill uh, Moscatel barrique. Full first fill maturation in Moscatel. It was basically, uh, that was the color of the whiskey. It was plum red. It was almost fluorescently plum red. And I looked at it, and it was cloudy. It was cloudy as soon as it came out of the bottle, a fresh bottle. It came out almost hazy. Hazy is a better word. And I asked the UK team about this. I said, what happened here? And they said, that's how it finished maturing. That's how we bottled it. It still went through the micron. It didn't filter any of the haze. The spirit had a haze to it. Uh, and the full spirit had a haze to it, which I found fascinating. It was almost like it had almost pre-oxidized pre or something in the cask. Uh, which, of course, oxidization in whiskey is another subject entirely and does not, re does not affect the spirit in the same way as oxidation, oxidization to wine does. Oxidization in wine sort of goes like this. It goes like, uh, improve, 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 gone. And that's how, that's wine oxidization. It's sort of like, you know when you open a bottle, nice bottle of red wine, it's good the first night. If you have it in a decanter and you seal that decanter or put a lid in the decanter, and then you come back to that wine the next night, it's often even better. Improve, improve, gone. Uh, 
Yeah, oh yeah, well, I love Moscatel finished whiskies. Lockie 87, this wasn't finished in Moscatel, this was full maturation. Um, full seven years in first fill Moscatel. We haven't seen too many Penderans 128, the code for them, uh, over the years. Um, but I hope we see some again soon, that'd be lovely. They're always fun whiskies. But I, <laughs> it's almost like I've gone, I've gone full circle actually in some ways, haven't I? Because I, was I started this uh, live stream talking about how I think distillers uh, in general should tread more carefully with wine casks in the uh, wine casks like Barolos and Tokays and Manzanillas and Palo Cotados on Sauternes and Moscatels should be less used in whiskey production. And I mean that. I know that sounds like I'm being an old school spoil sport here, but seriously, some, I mean, there's, they're more misses than hits in that, in that realm. Um, when they hit, they're fantastic. When they miss, they're, they're, they're not much fun. Now, that's all I came to talk about tonight. However, I won't leave you high and dry. Um, I'll talk a little bit about this. Uh, like I said, it's become quite perfumed. The barley note. An Isla barley note on the right on the mid palate. A tingle even. Special offer. Yes, Miss Dr. Akers. Um, I was going to say, if anyone in the stream uh, is thinking is on the edge about joining the, um, coming to the Brook Laddie night, I'm happy to do a, um, this is a last minute thing, of course, but if anyone wants to also bring a friend to the Brook Laddie night, if they want to book a ticket of 199 and they bring a friend, uh, send me a message and we'll, we'll look, some, we'll look it up. We'll, we'll look after them. Uh, it'll be, it'll be our pleasure to host them because it's, it's a very small intimate tasting and I'm almost, I've almost sold out, but I'd love to fill the room. It's only one long table. It's our own private lounge at the Royal Automobile Club. Um, so that's that's kind of the offer. It kind of sounds a bit vague, but send me a message if you're keen on coming to the Brook Lady night this Saturday night and you're keen on bringing a friend because I think that would make the, a real difference to the room, especially um, especially just enjoying the camaraderie of the society and the conviviality of a society event, which Andre articulated lovely last Saturday night. And I'm still on a high after Saturday night, I've got to say. Uh, that Saturday night vault zone, I'm still on a high after that. It's just such an amazing evening to be a part of. Um, let's get some questions in here. Uh, William, thanks for joining. SM Yan, does the society have to do much wood slash cask management? SM Yan, yes, heaps in fact, especially in the last four years. I'll give you a quick bit of company, uh, corporate history here for a second. True North, thanks for joining. Always good to see you, Ro. Um, uh, Book live stream as well, Cal. I'll get to that. I'll get to that. Remind me. So, um, wood management. Uh, excellent question, SMN. Especially yes in the last four years because 2004 to 2015. Our hands. Good to see you. 2004 to 2015, the society was wholly owned by Glen Morangy PLC. So, Glen Morangy slash Ardbeg owned the society as a club. They, they bought us in 2004. And they sold us off again in pretty much almost 10 years later in 2015. Uh, in 2015, however, we were sort of left a bit, uh, what's the word, high and dry. Uh, we still had lots of stocks. We still had lots of whiskey, obviously, and lots of it had been coming in. But it was sort of like, we're here and we're with a big company and then phew, we're independent again. So we sort of had to re realign our, our senses a bit and come back in and go, okay, we need a proper wood management program. Because we were using Glen Morangy's wood management policy their wood, their wood management policy, which is one of the best in the world. If you want to do any reading on Glen Morangy's wood management policy, it's unbelievably good. Uh, that's why Glen Morangy's quality is so high. That's why products like Astar and Nectar Ore and even Glen Morangy Original are great whiskies. So we were using their wood policy for a long time, but then after about, uh, and after 2015, we've had to develop our own. So the, the new one was developed very quickly, obviously, so we could maintain a quality uh, the, the panel would be happy with. And I think like last year, the society, like 2018, I don't know what this, not, this year's numbers are, but it'll be about the same or if not more. Last year, the society spent like 23 million euro on just like, on wood, on like wood policy, sourcing great wood, s talking with great sherry producers, uh, bourbon distilleries, cooperages, etc. So there was, there was a huge investment in wood. So what that means is we're gonna see over the next few years, um, a level of quality coming out of the society that uh, 
is as good as what we've always seen, if not even better. And I think that's really amazing. That's really exciting. Uh, Dr. Lamb, thanks for joining. Dog Eared Books, thanks for joining. So that was um, that was that was really what I wanted to get at tonight in saying that it's talking a bit about wines, talking a bit about wood policy. That's a that's a good segue though. I like that one. Um, and seeing how that changes and how distilleries react with that um, over time and how we react with distilleries in sourcing that spirit from them. And I think that's really exciting. Two little updates for you. Update on the book. Tomorrow, uh, Friday night, Friday night, I'm doing this, a review of the Founder's Tale, Pip Hill's latest book, uh, a story of the how the society came about. It's a lovely hardcover that's coming in October out turn. It's going to be previewed, however, on video, on the live stream here at 8 o'clock, next, this, next, this Friday night. So Friday, 8 p.m., see you here. We're going to do the live stream, and I'm going to be joined with a special guest, uh, Mr. Murray Hassan, who's going to, who's also been reading the book, and he's going to, um, we're going to talk about it. We're going to see what it's all about. Second little update about the live streams, however. This is exciting as well. Tomorrow night, I'm not doing the live stream, but it's still happening. So, how does that work? Uh, the live stream, this is super exciting, this happened today by the way. The live stream tomorrow night at 8 o'clock on the dot, whilst I'm going to be hosting uh, our BRICS event tomorrow night, to, you'll be able to sit and um, enjoy a live stream tomorrow night from our very own cellar master, Andrew Durbage. So Andrew's going to be broadcasting on this channel uh, at 8 o'clock tomorrow. So make sure you tune in and have a listen to a few things that Andrew has to say. I think it's going to be great. He'll have a totally different take on things than I've already done. And he'll have a few things to talk about. Um, yes, Benoit, tomorrow is rum night. You're right. I'll, I'll, I'll take some photos, but I won't be doing the stream. That'll be up to Andrew. So, Andrew, tune in tomorrow. Um, Muzz reviews. <laughs> uh, <laughs> Margaret, Margaret and David saw. Yes, we will. We will. <laughs> oh, Cal, no, we won't do two in one night. There's only enough hours in the day. So we'll do, um, Andrew's going to do the live stream tomorrow at 8 o'clock. Make sure you tune in, show him some support because he's going to, he's got some awesome stuff to go through and you might even taste a whiskey or two with him like you do with me. I don't really talk tasting notes too much or do reviews. I'm not a review kind of guy. I think that if I'm reviewing a whiskey and you're not enjoying it with me at the same time, uh, it's kind of like, ah, uh, yeah, I mean, I don't, I'm not a big fan of that. But if you want to see more of it, hey, you know, just, you know. Uh, no, I won't be going live from Bricks Cal. That's it's just Andrew tomorrow at 8. But I'll show you some, we'll put some photos up on our Instagram of what's happening at Bricks tomorrow night. If you do want to drink whiskey, however, than me, and you order at home, and you can drink it out of the pack at the same time, that's, you know, that's on the, that's available now. That was in September outturn. Five delicious uh, gathering casks. That's my only plug for tonight. Hey, um, that's all from me at the moment. I'm going to enjoy a dram. It's a rain, another rainy, uh, rainy night here in Sydney. And uh, I hope to see you all soon. And uh, best wishes. Signing off for now. Have a dram. Uh, it's good weather for it, and I'll um, I'll speak to you. I'll I'll see you all on Friday for the book review with Muzz. But you'll see Andrew at eight o'clock on this channel tomorrow. Tune in, and I'll see you soon. Bye.